Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers. How are you today, my friend? I am so happy to be here and so glad that you're there. And I have a question. Is this the first time you've seen the program? I hope there's a lot of you out there that could say yes to that question. And I hope it will not be the last time that you join us. And I never, ever want to be uh, negligent of those regular faithful viewers every day. God bless you. We love you so very much. We've got a great program here because I just met <clears throat> a new best friend. His name, I called him Dr. Patrick Morley, uh, well known in evangelical circles and promise keepers, that kind of thing. But he said to call him Pat. So I will do that. If I ever attained a doctorate, I'd probably expect people to use it. You know what I'm saying? He wrote Man Alive, and this is brand, I believe this one's brand new, is Christianity for You, and um, is well known for a book called Man in the Mirror. In fact, it's an entire ministry. Maybe a lot of you are familiar with that. So I am so glad to have him here because we're going to talk about a subject that I really do love, and that's about men, okay? Um, we have a lot of wonderful gals on here. We try to get the ladies, you know, in their Christian walk. But church needs to really take a look at the men, teenage boys and so forth and help them get on the right track. So I'm very happy to have Pat here today. And I'm going to join Stephanie in the kitchen. We're fixing an Amish broccoli and cauliflower um, salad. And it's a very, very popular salad, I understand. And one of our crew members said, does that have cauliflower in it? And uh, we said, yes. So he's not going to have anything to do with it. But we have others here who I think will. So we want to try it. And who can cook better than the Amish folks? So this is one of theirs. Before I join her, though, I again want to offer you search for the 12 apostles. If you watch all the time, I offer you things that can um, educate you in your Christian walk or give you history or uh, just some really good theology. I think it's so important to know the things of God. And I've always been intrigued with that group of 12 that Jesus chose. Um, a lot of people wouldn't want some of those folks in your church, but Jesus chose them and they got Christianity around the world. We wouldn't be sitting here today talking about the Lord if it hadn't been for those that he chose. You can learn a lot of history from this book on each of them, very carefully researched. And it's yours for the asking. That address is on your screen. Homekeepers, Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. And just write to me. And if you can please send a gift, a financial gift to keep us on the air. This book is worth it. Uh, but if you really can't, I'll send it to you anyway. We love our viewers and uh, want to do everything we can to educate you in the ways of the Lord. And I've joined Stephanie over here. We've already got a on this. Well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you my Amish story. Okay. I spoke for a, a, a singles conference at a campground. It was in Ohio. It was settled right in the Amish community. And, um, you know, camp meeting food isn't. And so I had this wonderful girl who was my host and she was my driver and everything. So we skipped every time and went just a few miles away to an Amish restaurant. Nice. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Delicious. That's the one thing I remember about the camp. Delicious. So. That's great. So, okay, so you have a head of broccoli and a head of cauliflower mm -hmm. here that's chopped up that you can throw in there. Yeah, Rich, we got I'm some cauliflower here for you. I have a cup of mayonnaise. I have a cup of light sour cream. I have a half a cup of sugar and a half a teaspoon of salt that I'm going to put it together. You know, the health conscious people are now making cauliflower um, substituting for their mashed potatoes? Yes, that's a, so, that's an Atkins thing. A what? Atkins, you know the Atkins oh, diet? Oh, is it? No carbs, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny, you said if you had earned your doctorate, you would yes. want to be called uh, well, doctor. you would be I calling. would too, but <laughs> Dr. Ertheline. You would be calling me. But it's so funny, like whenever I order anything from here, or, you know, for here or something, people say, what's your name? And I say, Stephanie, they say, what's your title? You know what I say? <laughs> Princess. <laughs> Well, that's as good as doctorate. Yeah. <clears throat> They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Probably okay. If I put get... some off balance a yeah. little. Yeah. 
Now this other stuff goes we'll on the on top, it, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, so we're just going to mix this up. This is so easy. Oh, you, you know how what, I love What was stuff. it? Tell them. Did you tell them what yeah, was in there? It's a cup of mayonnaise, a cup of sour cream, a half a cup of sugar, and a, a teaspoon of salt. Mmm. Yeah. I just want to taste it. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you, the dressing's worth it. No matter what you put it on. Yeah. <laughs> it will improve it. Rich, I think you better think twice. I think you should just try it. You shouldn't make faces before you try things. Yeah, that's not nice. Let me get rid of this stuff. <clears throat> and you can just get this all toss that. Up. Oh, I have a feeling I'm gonna like it. I think you are. And if you use the light stuff, mm -hmm. uh, it's downright healthy. Yeah. It's just got a little bit of sugar in it. Yeah. If you just wanna put the bacon and the cheese. Which goes first? Oh, let's do bacon first. Okay. And this is just crumbled up. This was, this was actually the cooked. Yeah. It's easier. Easier. Oh, I'd mix that up. I wouldn't put it just on yeah. top. It's a lot of, looks like a lot of bacon. But. Yes, ma'am, I think I will like this yeah, one. Yeah, it smells good. Mm-hmm. Okay, some cheese. Any cheese of your choice. Yeah. I think gorgonzola might taste good on this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think feta would be good in here. Mm -hmm. I like feta cheese. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, it needs to hang out a little bit, but yeah, just the a little. Flavors need to marry. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done one before. There. Uh. Oh my. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Take Let a bite. Let me get my dainty mm -hmm. bite. Let me be dainty. Mm hmm. What do you think? Oh, that's good. It needs to be chilled. Actually, though, it's a very, very popular recipe. Yeah. And um, I was happy to run across it. I might use a little less sugar. But besides that, mm -hmm. that's very good. All right. Yep. If you want that uh, recipe, right. that information is coming up on your screen. And there are so many places to use this. You know, your church supper where you want to really impress people. Mm -hmm. Uh, you take some of this in there, and you're going to be the one they'll be talking about, I promise you. Stay with me. I want you to meet my new best friend. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, please send your request along with a gift of $5 or more to Homekeepers, P.O. Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. All right. Welcome to Homekeepers. Well, so thank you. Glad to meet you. Nice to meet you. You know, I had heard of the Man in the Mirror yeah. book, and then I uh, understood that it's kind of taken on a life of its own, and yeah. it's a ministry. Give me a well, one, on one thing led to another, you know, mm -hmm. and you just keep putting mm -hmm. things together. So uh, I have this sentence that I use to describe my life. Because God is good, my life hasn't turned out like I planned. <laughs> <laughs> that is really good, yeah. for sure. Um, Give me just a little background uh, in your life. Were you uh, raised up in a Christian home and all those good things? I was, but I was raised in a Christian home that didn't know Christ, if that makes any sense to mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I've and heard so, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So here's, here's the deal. Uh, in 1926, that sounds like it's going to be a long story, <laughs> 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 but it's not that long. But in 1926, when my father was two years of age, the youngest of four children, his father abandoned the family. So my dad grew up in a home with a single mom. And she did a great job, but they were very poor. My dad went to work when he was six, had two jobs with his older brother. They got up at 3 a.m., had oh a bread truck word. route and then a paper route. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so, you know, my dad, uh, never he never felt the scratch of his father's whiskers. He never heard his father read him a bedtime story. He never tossed a ball in the background, had his hair tussled, uh, smelled his father's work clothes, heard a truck door slam at the end of the day, signaling that his dad was about to re-enter the family orbit. And, and so when he became a man, my dad had to, uh, had to decide if he would repeat the cycle or try to break it. I'm grateful that he wanted to break it. Mm -hmm. But what it meant to be a man and a husband and a father, Arthleen was completely unexampled. So he basically yeah. was left to guess. Now, wisely, my mom and dad decided we needed to get some moral, they needed to get some moral and religious instruction for their four boys. I'm the oldest of four. So we became part of a church. 
But our church had a vision uh, for my dad, but it was to put him to work. Uh, and he had a great work ethic. He's worked since he was six. So by the time my dad was 40, he was the top layman uh, in the church. But our church had no vision to show him what it meant to be a man, which is why he came. And so uh, he just got burned out and we left the church. I was in the 10th grade. Um, we had been doing pretty well until mm -hmm. that time. Uh, but in the middle of my senior year, I quit high school. Uh, my next brother, he followed in my footsteps. He eventually died of a heroin overdose. Mm -hmm. uh, my next brother never held a job for more than six months until he was 50. And my uh, younger brother is a recovering uh, alcoholic and is divorced. And uh, dad, you know, dad just never saw it coming. And um, so. Well, I think there's a lot of that still in the church today. Thank you. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd be very careful to criticize pastors. My family's full of them. Yeah, well, I'm very, I, I, I'm not, I've never admit. met a pastor who got into the pastoring business mm -hmm. who didn't want to grow a flock, both numerically and also uh, in the quality of the sheep. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, pastors love uh, people. That's why they got into the business. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that we see is that they're pulled in so many directions today that they just yeah. need somebody who has an expertise to help them. So we, we basically were church I consultants. Agree. Poor pastors, they're supposed to be counselors, psychologists, contractors, bankers, yeah, all the above. Exactly. Um, what, what is the man in the mirror about? Well, so, uh, you know, my dad had his experience and then I had mine. I, I married Patsy. Uh, I tricked her into thinking that I was a Christian. I, I thought I was. But it was pretty clear uh, we had a little ambiguity of terms <laughs> <laughs> about what it meant. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I, I wanted to have a relationship with God. So we started going to a church that did have a vision to disciple me to be a godly man, a godly husband, and a godly father. So when I walked through that church door, there were some guys, they knew their mission. It was making disciples, and they zeroed in on me. They took me under their wing. They showed me the ropes. And, uh, and so uh, I've had a very different experience than my father has had. And, uh, and so the reason I'm doing Man in the Mirror, and I'll uh, answer your question <laughs> eventually. <laughs> <laughs> the, reason I'm, uh, the reason I'm so passionate about men's discipleship is, is I've seen the difference that it makes when a church gets it right with a guy like me. They got it right with me, but, but, but my dad had a very and so my family line is still trying to recover from that decision that A, my grandfather made to desert the family and B, that my dad made to, to walk away from the church. Yeah, and think of all of the men in the congregation who have similar stories. Many, many men have um, that. I did notice with your brothers, apparently you were the one yeah. who hooked in with Jesus. Well, God graciously grafted the gospel into or back into my family line through my wife's family line. My wife led me to Christ. And then uh, graciously, I was able to lead my brother who died of the heroin overdose. He was a, a Vietnam War casualty, basically. Uh, led, was able to lead him to Jesus. And uh, both of my parents made deathbed uh, professions of faith. They both uh, died in, in Christ. Um, whether I led them to Christ or back to Christ, I'm not sure. Well, but, you know. Jesus makes such a difference. <laughs> um, and I've said it many times with the guests sitting there. Yeah. I was raised in a Christian home, mm -hmm. a pastor's home. But then I say something like this, mm -hmm. and it validates the gospel. It validates you, it. you didn't learn it by rote. You no. just... Um, it's true. Jesus Christ is alive. Yep. He's real. Uh, before we go any further, tell me about your radio ministry. Um, because what do you want to know? Well, you're on, uh, We're on 700 several, sta 700 several, stations. several hundred stations. Se several. <laughs> We're on several stations. And uh, it's a, it's a one-minute program. It's a little mm -hmm. nugget for guys. We, we try to get it scheduled during drive time so they can get a little, little bump during the day. Well, as an old veteran war horse of the church, to me this is the greatest need is to get the men right, get them in there excited about God, following him, following his way, because when you get the guy right, other things fall in place. Oh, we say this all the time. You know, we say this, I said, can you picture ever getting the world right without getting the church right? Probably not. If that's true, can you picture ever getting the church right without getting families right? Probably not. Can you picture then getting families right without ever getting marriages right? Not gonna happen. 
And then if that's true, can you picture ever getting marriages right unless we get you women straightened out? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> uh, it's a little joke. Yeah. But I mean, really, when you think about it, it, it really is about them. Even when a woman rips her family apart, it's usually after years of emotional neglect. So you get men right, get the fa marriage right, get the marriage right, get the family right, get the family right, get the church right, get the church right, and it really can't have this impact on one, the world. One, one quick thing. I had a, a gal here years ago. She was a psychologist. And I said, I want to ask you a question. Um, if you have a family and they need counseling and the woman is just, the mother's just a total flake, just yeah. really off the, off the rails, but the dad's good and he's stable mm -hmm. and he's there, how do the kids turn out? She said, never thought about that. And she's out for a few minutes, she says, they come out okay. <laughs> 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 and uh, Satan knows. Satan knows, yeah. Satan knows if he gets the head. I yeah. mean, the Bible says the men are the head of the house. So mm -hmm. If you take the head down, not the rest of the body doesn't work too well. Well, men today are just really under severe attack. They are. Now, uh, when I travel mm -hmm. uh, and a stranger learns that I work with men, they'll often say, oh, that must be really hard. And I always say, you got the wrong guy. I have the greatest job in the world because every day we see, we're seeing men come to Christ Praise and growing God. in their faith. So there's a, there's a robust ministry going out there. But the, but the flip side of that is, mm -hmm. is that men today are under severe attack, especially men under 40. I mean talking about the enemy, the, the, the institution of uh, marriage and mm -hmm. family is being, is, is being gutted as, right. as we sit here talk, talking. It's in dire, dire straits. Yeah, and we won't even get into same-sex marriage, but everything is yeah. to, to undermine that. Now you have, um, you have this big ministry with yeah. what, particular leaderships over a, a certain part of the country? Okay, so, um, uh, I love numbers, I hate numbers, I like big numbers, but we started 27 years ago in a bar as a Bible study. And over these last 27 years, we've been able to work with 35,000 churches to impact 12 million men. But we want to wow. go- Wow. Yes, yeah. Now, a lot of those are really deep transformational counters, but a lot of times it's just, you know, sort of brushing mm -hmm. up against them, you know. But we, we want to see, uh, be, by the end of this decade, 10 million men leading powerful lives transformed by Jesus Christ. In order to do that, we are expanding. Uh, we're hiring 330 area directors, one for every 1,000 churches. So the 330,000 churches in America. So geographically distributed in local communities, church consultants, if you will, who work with churches to help them be more effective discipling their men. Our, our vision is for every church to disciple every man. Uh, no, really what we mean is for every willing church to mm -hmm. disciple every willing man. I am praying that will become like a revival, like a prairie fire. We're going to put the website up. We'll leave it up the rest of the program and they can get all that information through that. Yeah, now they can go to manandthemirror.org uh -huh. and there's a link there. But there's also, if somebody's interested in this as a career, now if there's somebody listening mm -hmm. who either is interested or knows somebody who might be interested uh, in a career in men's discipleship, uh, this is a professional position. And mm -hmm. uh, they can go to areadirectors.org, areadirectors.org, and uh, there's a, a video there, a job description, mm -hmm. frequently asked questions, a prospectus, all, all the information they need. Take the next step, get the word out. You can, you know, so it's, it's, it's all there. Well, I'm praying that everyone watching and church leaders and so forth, uh, that we've just kind of stimulated the thought that men need some special attention right yeah. now. Oh, I hope, Everything, I everything's, hope so. I hope everything's so. upside down. It's, just going the wrong way. Okay, your book, Man Alive. We have 75 of those area directors already appointed, by the way, out, out of the 330. So we've been at and this for two years. And what a resource years. for the local church. Uh, it's a, it's an amazing thing. Do you take advantage of that? Uh, Man Alive, uh, transforming your seven primal needs. <laughs> what are they? Well, that's a guy kind of a word, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, it is. All right, so let me tell you how this book came about because this is where these seven needs come from. So uh, I have... Uh, over these last decades, uh, I've literally had thousands of one-on-one -on -one conversations with men. And uh, when I uh, talk to men and they try to express the, the inner aches and pains, the angst that they feel, they will invariably mention one or more of seven things, seven symptoms, let's call them. This is very, very interesting. That's very concise. So they, seven. they, they will say one of these things. They'll, they'll say, first of all, They'll say, you know, I just don't, uh, I just feel like I'm in this all alone. Or, and or, they'll say, you know, I don't feel like God cares about me personally. Not really. 
I don't feel like my life has a purpose. It feels random. I have these destructive behaviors that keep dragging me back down. My soul feels dry. Uh, my most important relationships, they're not healthy. And then finally, I really don't feel like I'm doing anything that will make a difference and leave the world a better place. And so, uh, isn't it interesting? It's pretty Be sad. Well, but, but God has wired us to want to satisfy those needs, and the longing is <clears throat> comes when they're, they're going unfulfilled. But uh, in His Word and through, uh, through Christ and through being involved with other guys, men can satisfy each of these needs, the corresponding needs, in Christ. Yeah, I've often, <clears throat> just in my observation, noticed that women fall to the cross a little bit easier. We don't have any problem. Jesus says, come, we, we, we're there, you know, kneel down and, mm -hmm. and um, we can express, we can pour out our heart to him and all. And men are not wired that way so much. Well, here, here's part of the problem. Uh, so when a, when a woman has a problem, now these are generalizations, but right. we use generalizations because they're generally true. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as a generalization, when, when a woman has a problem, she tends to move toward relationships mm -hmm. because that's where she's going to find solace, comfort, encouragement, counsel, so forth. When men have a problem, they tend to move toward isolation. Mm -hmm. They mo tend to move away from relationships. And so anybody who's ever watched National Geographic knows that the lion never goes after the herd. Uh, the, the, the lion always goes after what? It goes after the, the, the stray, the one that's been isolated from the, the herd. Every predator knows the strategic value of isolation. And men, if you're listening, or women, if you're... Uh, the, the, the men in your life, uh, it is Satan's strategy to yeah. steal, to kill, and to destroy. He I is a predator. I know where you're going, yeah. yes. And so, uh, and, and so men are more susceptible to uh, these, these, uh, these attacks, or at least so it seems, for, at least right now in our time, in our era, men do seem to be more vulnerable. What do you think the women's movement of the 60s, does that have anything to do with what we see now in culture and in the church? Well, you know, you have to differentiate between the, the radical feminist movement right. and what I think is... Because there were some things that need to be corrected. Yeah, uh, but, but, but the feminism, uh, I, I love that. Yeah. You know, the, you know, I want to... Uh, Jesus was a... If you want it, Jesus was a feminist. I mean, yeah. Jesus... <laughs> he was a friend ushered, of women, yes. He sir. ushered in a good, good news for women. And so I, I like all those, those things that are advancing women. Uh, there are unintended consequences, and so uh, basically men now are portrayed in popular culture. I don't think that this is really true, or most people think it, but in pop culture, they are portrayed as, as sex-crazed, baboon-brained uh, hayseeds. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this from an image standpoint... It's, it's very true. Uh I don't even watch sitcoms anymore unless they're real old. Mm -hmm. I, I can handle Andy Griffith, but some of them are just so awful. Yeah, I don't but watch them. But the male them. is always portrayed <clears throat> as the idiot yeah. and the, the one to be laughed at. <clears throat> and anything in culture kind of gets into the church. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yes. I mean, so, uh, you, you would like to think that the church was having more influence, influence on yeah. the culture than the culture is having on the church. Yeah. But it, it does go back and forth. Here's, here's the real problem in, in my, my view. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm more of a practitioner, but I'm a scholar, a scholar practitioner. But, so I study, I study these things, and uh, the difference is that, that Christianity is no less uh, prominent than it was 40 years ago. In fact, it's more prominent. But the problem is, is that the, the, the culture was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Yes. Uh, even as late as the mid eight, mid 1980s, but that has all changed, mm -hmm. and uh, and so Christians were a, min a minority then, but their values predominated in culture. Today, Christians are still in the minority, but their values are no longer the majority report, and so anything anything goes. It's just you know, it's just anything goes now. I know. I gr I grew up in a system in the United States where. But I believed had a support system, yeah. uh, morals, ethics, mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, culture was there to support it. That's not there anymore. Yeah, that's not there. Now, um, as I said, coming from a, a long line of pastors and so forth, I'm wondering 
if pastors, maybe they take the easy way, because you give a woman a job to do in a church and she's going to do it. Yeah. And that's easy. Say, sister mm -hmm. so-and-so, could you do this? But to go ask brother so-and-so to do it might take a little more effort. Okay, so when we, we work with churches, and, uh, you know, as I say, we work with tens of thousands of churches, and um, when we have somebody go into a church, uh, we ask these questions. Do you need more men? Yes. Do you need more leaders for men? Yes. Do you need more men to populate your growth groups? Yes. Do you need more men to populate your service and mission opportunities? Yes. Well, how, how, do you, how do you make that happen? Well, Jesus had one and only one solution. Uh, making disciples is God's designated way to release the power of His gospel on all these problems that we see in culture. And I will even go further, Arthelene, I would say this. I would say that since it is a command, go and make disciples, it's not mm -hmm. a suggestion, it's not a priority choice. And since those orders have never been amended or rescinded or altered in any way, that it's, it's a choice between right and wrong. Therefore, it is a, a moral component. And so I would say this, anything less than a plan to disciple every willing person in your church, male or female, is a, is a catastrophic moral failure. So what we've done, we developed a model that we call No Man Left Behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the pastor who really does want to make disciples that implements this model, watch this, these are, these are vetted statistics. Um, a church that will use the No Man Left Behind model will experience on average a 48% increase in the number of men attending in two and a half years. Hallelujah! and an 84% increase in the number of men involved in discipleship in that same two and a half years. So uh, roughly 50% more men and almost doubling the number of men in discipleship. Now, most people think it's too good to be true. We thought so too. That's why we sent it off to a statistician That's to figure it out. That's some of the best news I've ever heard and we're completely out of time. Can I get Oh, a, this is crazy. Can I get a promise that you'll come back? Um, we can get a, a uh, possible promise that I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get him to come back. Don't I wouldn't worry. promise that I could. Uh, <laughs> Join me next time remembering no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you would like a video copy of today's Homekeepers program for just $19.95, call 1-800-229-0059 for credit card orders or send a gift of at least $19.95 to Homekeepers, P.O. Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida 33758. Be sure to note the program number which appears on your screen.